Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's free Microsoft 7680 certification training course. And this module is on software restriction policies. I'm James Messer, and we're going to go through the requirements from the Microsoft certification that talks about setting software restriction policies, setting application control policies, and setting a group policy or a local security policy to set the software restriction policies. We're going to focus on software restrictions. We have another video for this particular section that is next on doing the app locker. So we'll look at app locker next. This video will focus solely on doing software restriction policies. You set software restriction policies using your local security policy editor or the group policy editor to restrict that. And you can just simply go to your start and run gpedit.msc, and it'll bring up that group editor. You could also type in group policy, and it will be able to do that as well. There's a little bit of overlap here with AppLocker. Both of these do similar things, allow or disallow someone to run a certain program. But AppLocker has some other capabilities that are a little bit better when it comes to managing it. But unfortunately, the scope is a little bit smaller with AppLocker. For example, the group policy changes that we'll make here that are associated with doing software restrictions work no matter whether you're running Windows XP, running Windows Vista, and Windows 7. And that means that we can set some policies. And if somebody logs on their Windows XP machine, these software restriction policies will work properly. AppLocker, as you'll find in the next video, only works in Windows 7 Ultimate and Windows 7 Enterprise. It doesn't work on Windows Vista or Windows XP or some of those other flavors of Windows 7. So you may find yourself actually using both of these to be able to administer and manage the applications that run on your computer. We're going to go to the settings in your local security policy or your group policy editor under Computer Configuration, Windows Settings, Security Settings, and Software Restriction Policies. And we'll step through those so that you can see exactly the way that works. One thing to keep in mind, and what you'll see as we go through this, this is a relatively manual process. There are no wizards that set this up for you. You cannot specify a certain rule type and have it affect multiple executable files within a folder. You now have to use this program to go into individual folders and set very specific rule types. So this is a little bit slow if you have many, many rules that you need to set up. And that's something when you see AppLocker, whenever we work with that, it has some nice wizards. Well, you don't have those wizards wizards available with software restriction policies. To start the group policy editor, you would go and do a gpedit.msc, and it would load up your group policy editor. If you're working without a domain, you could go to the type local and go to your local security policy as well. Either one of those will work on your machine. I'm going to do a group policy editor. Here's another way to do it. Just type group policy, and you can bring up the option to edit group policy as well. Either one of those will work just fine. This group policy editor, since I'm on a domain, means that I could start setting policies for everybody else that's on my domain as well. So I'm going to go into my computer configuration under my Windows settings under the Security Settings, and underneath there is a section for Software Restriction Policies. These software restriction policies are pretty straightforward. You can see there's some options in here to set different security levels by default. I can add rules, which we will be doing later into those folder. And then I have three other options right here in the base folder of Enforcement, Designated File Types, and Trusted Publishers. The Enforcement option allows me to set some global enforcement parameters for my software restriction policies. Perhaps a more reasonable method of setting restrictions is to allow all software files, but don't worry so much about the libraries those are going to run. Notice you also have an option to allow these software restriction policies to apply to all users or all users except the local administrators of a computer. This allows you to log in locally, but not be restricted with the same software restriction policies that you may have set up already. And there's also another option here to enforce or ignore any certificate rules that you've set up. And we're going to look at certificate rules in just a moment. But certificate rules are going to check to see if a particular file that you're ex executing has been digitally signed by a publisher. So if you're starting to run an application, there's many, many different executables that run on a computer. And if you're 
your computer has to check every single one of those every time you start the executable, it could have an impact on the performance of your computer. That's why there's this global setting where you can enforce or ignore every certificate rule that might be in your software restriction policies. We can also set, as some of these global settings, these designated file types. Just because it's an executable file doesn't mean that's the only kind of file that's able to run on your computer. As you can see here, it's Windows batch files, it's Microsoft DOS applications, it's there's executables, help files, HTML applications, shortcuts. There's a lot of different programs that can run in a Windows environment. And this is the list that comes in here by default. If you'd like to get rid of them, you can get rid of some. If you think an internet shortcut should not apply as one of these executables, you can simply remove it. Notice that you can't remove things like an executable, a DLL, or a Visual Basic script. Those are built in to this particular system. If there's an ex extension you'd like to add as an executable file type, you can type the extension in here and also add it into this mix. And then going forward, all of these software restriction policies will also apply to any files that have that extension associated with them. When you're applying all of these different kind of rules into your computer, there needs to be some kind of hierarchy. We need to know which particular rule is going to take a priority if there happens to be a conflict. In our next video, we're going to talk about AppLocker. You'll learn more about it. But one thing to keep in mind is even if we set up these software restriction policies and they might deny access to a program to run, it doesn't matter if AppLocker has already been set to allow that program to run. In every case, AppLocker is always is going to win. Whether AppLocker says to allow it or disallow it, AppLocker always wins. If it's not an AppLocker, then we can look at our software restriction policies. And we're going to look at each of these rule types in this order. It's going to start with the most specific kind of rule, which is a hash rule, and then work its way down this list. If there's a certificate rule next, a path rule next, a network zone rule, and then lastly, the default rules, that's the order that it will decide whether a particular rule has precedence over another. It's very easy to add rules in here. We can simply go to the folder that says Additional Rules. You'll notice there are a couple of rules that are in here by default. These are rules that allow the Windows operating system to function. You don't want to turn on your software restriction policies and then realize you haven't allowed Windows to work properly. So these rules have been added by default. If I right mouse click, I can add other rules, a new certificate rule, a new hash rule, a new network zone rule, and a new path rule. Notice that these are in here in alphabetical order. They're not in here by the order of precedence. So you have to always remember that hash rules are considered first, then certificate rules, then my path rules, then my network zone rules, and then finally whatever your default rules will be that we'll look at in a moment. So if you're setting these up and you're adding a certain rule type, make sure you understand the order they're going to be in based on this. And then you can choose the proper type and add some. And when we get near the end of this video, we'll run through an example of how we can enable or disable certain applications to run. Before we do that, let's step through these different rule types and really understand what they affect whenever we enable or disable a certain rule. Our first rule type and the most specific rule type we can find as a software restrictive rule are these hash rules. And as the name implies, what we're doing is getting a very, very specific fingerprint of a particular executable file. And we're either allowing it or disallowing based on that. So it's a very specific rule. You really can't fool it. If that particular file was upgraded, was changed, it's not going to apply anymore. Because as you can see, a hash rule looks at an executable file that is a specific version, the name of the file, the operating system it runs on, and then you can allow or disallow what it's doing. That gives you a lot of control, some very, very, very specific control, in fact, all the way down to an exact version of a particular program. If you're rolling out a new application and you want to be sure that nobody's going to run the old application, that old application might corrupt the database, you could set a software restrictive rule here that does not allow that particular version to run, but still allows the new one to run. So a lot of control there. One of the challenges you have with that, however, is that you have to make a new rule for every single execution executable. If there are 16 different versions of that program, you may find yourself adding many, many, many hash rules into this because you have to update it and change it and modify it and administer it every time a new version of that application comes out. The second most specific rule type is called a certificate rule. And this refers to an entire publisher. 
if you wanted to create a rule that allowed someone to run every program that was made by Microsoft, you would create a certificate rule that would allow that. What it's allowing really is this cryptographic signature that is put on an executable file. Only Microsoft can sign files and have them look like it came from Microsoft. You only Apple can sign certain files and have it look like it came from Apple. You can't create your own certificate and pretend you're Microsoft and sign it and think that your operating system is going to recognize it as coming from Microsoft because it simply is not. This is a very, very broad rule, but it certainly allows you in one fell swoop to allow or disallow certain manufacturers' files from running. But this also means that you can have, have a large effect over a certain file type. What if there's a certain file that you did not want want to work, run properly or run from a certain manufacturer, and all you have is a certificate role. Well, that's too bad. Every every file that's signed by that particular publisher is, is not going to run on your environment. So you have to be very careful when you're setting this, especially if you're restricting certain programs from running with a certificate role. The application itself also must be cryptographically signed by that publisher. Microsoft didn't sign every single executable they make. So just by setting a deny doesn't mean that you're really going to catch all of them. You're really only going to catch all of them that have been signed. This is also, as we saw with our global settings, very, very resource intensive, especially if you're checking every single executable and you're running a lot of executable files on your computer. All those programs that are running have to be checked to see have they been signed and then to see if these certificate rules are going to apply. If you have some older computers out there could be slowing them down quite a bit just because you are enabling some of these certificate rules. The next rule type down is the path rule. And as that name implies, we're really allowing or disallowing applications based on where they reside on your computer or on a server. We're allowing a certain directory or maybe just a specific file in a location to run on a computer. This gives you a lot of control. If you're trying to do entire directories, you can simply say everything in this directory is allowed or is not allowed. And that gives you some control, but it also limits you in a way because it's really only looking at a folder. If I took that executable file and I moved it to another folder that is allowed, well, then I'd be able to run it just fine. So you have to keep that in mind whenever you're setting up some of these path rules that a smart user, if they're able to move that executable, would still be able to run that properly. The network zone rule is the next most specific rule type. But this is a very, very broad setting that we would use to allow or disallow certain programs to be installed onto our computer. And offhand, that sounds great. That is a lot of control to allow or disallow that based on what zone it came from. That means if somebody downloaded something from the internet zone, you could say that that file could not be installed onto a computer. And that allows you to really mitigate the risk you might have from a file that you don't know where it came from. You don't have a lot of control over it. You can make sure your users don't accidentally install something they're not supposed to. But on the disadvantage side, it only applies to installer files. It only applies to MSI files. This does not apply to every single executable that you might download from the internet that happens to install an application. It only allows or disallows very specific types of installer files. And it also only applies to Internet Explorer. If you use Internet Explorer, you know there's an internet zone. There's an intranet zone. There's a trusted zone. There's an untrusted zone. If you were to use Firefox, for instance, those zones don't apply. So in those cases, the network zone rules would not even work because the browser itself has no context to where those files were downloaded. Once we go through all of those more specific rules, the most general rule that you'll find are the default rules. And you can allow all applications, all software on your computer simply won't run unless there are ones that you allow. It's a very, very tight rule, a very secure rule. But it also means that you're going to have to individually enable every program you would like to run on this computer. You can also have this set up as a basic user, which means you'll be able to run any program that doesn't require administrative rights. Again, a little bit more secure than just running every single file, regardless of the rights of the user, which is the default. The default is unrestricted, which means depending on your user permissions, you can run anything on the computer unless one of those other rules says otherwise. 
let's set up a rule on my computer that might restrict us from running a certain program. In fact, I'm going to go to my hard drive here. And in my program files directory, there is a Microsoft Games folder. And let's say Mahjong is a program that I would like to disallow. And as you can see, if I double click Mahjong, it does tell me that I'm not running hardware acceleration here. But otherwise, it allows me to run the Mahjong program just fine. That's great. But I would like to restrict that. So we're going to go to our software restriction policies under our additional rules. I'm going to right mouse click that. And I've got an option here as to what I can do. I can choose a new certificate rule, a new hash rule, a network zone rule, and a path rule. Well, this is a program that came from Microsoft. But I only want to restrict that one particular file from running. So a certificate rule probably wouldn't apply. A network zone rule would not apply because I did not download this from the internet. And it is not an MSI installation file. It's an executable that is already on my computer. So a, a path rule might apply. That's something I could put in there. But if I wanted to really be specific, I would choose a hash rule. And to enable a hash rule, let's choose Browse. And I'm going to move uh, back to my Microsoft Games folder instead of Solitaire. Let's choose Mahjong. And I'm going to choose that Mahjong application and click Open. Notice that it finds in Mahjong the exact version number of that program, the executable, the name. What it is is the executable for the Mahjong Titans game from the Microsoft Windows operating system and Microsoft Corporation is the publisher. And my default security level is to disallow it. And that's exactly what I'd like to do. My default rule allows everything else to run. So that means I've got a hash rule right here at the top. Everything else is going to work except that. So let's see how that rule works. Let's now go back to this and double click. And it says, this program's blocked by group policy. For more information, contact your system administrator. Because we didn't set a path rule, if there were other programs in here, we could run those just fine. This hash rule is very, very specific to this executable. And now I'm not allowed to run Mahjong on this computer. Let's review some of the topics from this particular video. Our first question, what kind of software restriction policy can control an application using a unique signature? Well, that's exactly the type that we just used to be able to disallow access to the Mahjong program, and that was a hash rule. Our second question, what two user types could be controlled through an enforcement policy? If you recall, we could allow everybody on our computer to run programs. But there was another option as well, which means that we could allow all users except the local administrators to apply to any of these policies that we're setting. And the last question, which browser is required to take advantage of a network zone rule? Well, that, that internet zone, the intranet zone, the trusted zone, the untrusted zone, those are only available if you download a program and you're downloading it with Internet Explorer. That covers our requirements. Now you should have a pretty good idea how you could set software restriction policies on your network or on your computers and be able to allow or disallow certain applications from running in your Windows 7 operating system. If you'd like to look at any of our other free Microsoft certification videos, you'd like to participate in our message boards or send me a message, you can visit our website at ProfessorMesser.com.